What's up guys? So today is our first proteins lecture. So let's go ahead and jump right in and define what a protein is. So a protein is going to be a macromolecule consisting of one or more long chains of amino acid residues. So remember when we talked about carbohydrates, polysaccharides are long chains of repeating monosaccharide residues. Usually you have all of the same residue in homopolysaccharides or you have repeating of two different residues in heteropolysaccharides. Well, proteins are a little bit more complex. So there are 20 different standard amino acids that you see in proteins, and almost every protein contains every amino acid to some extent. Another thing that's different about proteins is that these long amino acid chains have to fold over on top of each other, generally forming this globular structure that you see with myoglobin here. This is called protein folding, and this is what creates the native structure. So native meaning the biologically active structure of proteins. So what are some of the functions of proteins? Well, there's a whole lot of them, but the ones that we're gonna focus on in this class are, they are biological catalyst, they're important structural components in our body, and just like carbs and lipids, we can use them as an energy source. Okay, also similar to carbohydrates, we're going to talk about proteins using polymer notation. So as I mentioned in the last slide, the individual monomer building blocks for proteins are amino acids. If we have two amino acids covalently bonded together, we have a dipeptide. Three amino acids would make a tripeptide. Two to 10 would be an oligopeptide. More than 10 would be a polypeptide. And then an amino acid chain with a well-defined 3D structure. So we're talking generally more than 50 amino acids. It's formed a native folded structure. This is what we're going to refer to as a protein. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the building blocks of proteins. Let's talk about these amino acids. So from a chemistry standpoint, amino acids are molecules that contain at least one carboxyl group and at least one amino group. So in addition to being the building blocks of protein, we already talked about proteins as being a good energy source. So our body loves to break down muscle protein for energy during fasting. Also, a lot of cell signaling molecules use amino acids as precursors. That means they're built from amino acids. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the chemistry of amino acids. So notice the title of this slide says alpha amino acids. So I want you guys to think back to the first part of the semester when we talked about carboxylic acids and we mentioned the alpha carbon on carboxylic acids. I want you to pause this video and see if you can remember what the alpha carbon means. Okay, so remember if we have a carboxylic acid, and why don't you go ahead and pause the video again and see if you can tell me the name of this carboxylic acid. So if you guessed heptanoic acid, you would be correct. So remember when we're talking about carboxylic acids, the carbon next to the carbonyl is our alpha carbon. And then the next one is beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, so on, all the way through the Greek alphabet. So all of the 20 standard amino acids are all alpha amino acids. So that means they're gonna have four groups attached to the central carbon, which is our alpha carbon. The first one is going to be our carboxylic acid, which we have drawn. We're also going to have an amino group attached to the alpha carbon, a hydrogen, and then a variable R group. And this variable R group is what's gonna give each amino acid its properties. That's how they're gonna be different from each other. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the stereochemistry for alpha amino acids. So just like we did with carbohydrates, we can use Fischer projections to show the two different enantiomers that exist for each alpha amino acid. So I want you to pause the video and I want you to answer a couple of questions for me before we go on. So take a look at this pair of carbohydrates that we have at the top. Can you classify each of these as an L or D sugar? And do you remember which one is more common in nature? Okay, so if you said the one on the left is a D sugar, you are correct, and the one on the right is an L sugar. And in case you don't remember how you tell, you're gonna look at the chiral carbon, which is marked with the green star. 
that is furthest from the carbonyl group. And remember, we always put the carbonyl group at the top of these projections. So if the chiral carbon that is furthest from the carbonyl group has the non-hydrogen on the right, it's going to be D. If the non-hydrogen is on the left, it's going to be L. So the exact same rules apply for amino acids. So if the amino group, which is our non-hydrogen group for amino acids, is on the left, it's going to be an L amino acid. And if that non-hydrogen group is on the right, it's going to be a D amino acid. And now these are just the opposite of sugar. So most sugars in nature exist as the D enantiomer, whereas amino acids are almost exclusively L amino acids in nature. Okay, so let's go ahead and try a couple examples. Go ahead and turn your textbook to page 460 and look at table 12.1. I want you to pause this video, see if you can identify the name of both of these amino acids and identify the stereochemistry, so either D or L. Okay, so this first amino acid on the left is valine, and this is the D in antiomer. Now this other one's a little bit harder. You probably figured out that it was alanine because it only has a methyl group for a side chain. But in order to put this into a Fischer projection, you're going to have to rotate it a couple of times. So remember, we want to align this molecule where the carbonyl is at the top and the side chain is at the bottom. And then we want to rotate it to where the vertical lines are going away from us and the horizontal lines are coming towards us. And when we do that, we should see the amino group on the left. So this is an L amino acid. And if you're having trouble doing this in your head, pull out your molecular model kit, go ahead and build L alanine and see if you can make it look like all three of these L alanine structures here. Okay, so let's get to know our amino acids. So for each of the 20 standard amino acids, I want you to be able to identify the structure be able to convert from condensed to skeletal structure, know the one letter code, the three letter code, and the name, and be able to classify them as nonpolar, polar neutral, polar acidic, or polar basic. So let's start with just the amino acids that have hydrophobic side chains. Now these are often going to be found in the interior of proteins. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later when we talk about globular proteins and the protein folding rule. So our first one here that has an isopropyl group for a side chain is valine. Its three-letter code is VAL, and its one-letter code is V. Next to it here, we have an isobutyl group for the side chain, and that's going to be leucine, LEU, and the one-letter code is L. Our next one here that has a sec butyl group as a side chain is isoleucine. Its three letter code is ILE and the one letter code is I. Now these first three here are collectively known as the branched chain amino acids because they all have these side chains that have a carbon branch on them. Our next one is alanine, which has a methyl group for a side chain and its code is going to be ALA for the three letter code and A for the one letter code. So this next one is the first one that has more than just carbons and hydrogens in the side chain. We have a sulfur, but if you remember, the electronegativity difference between carbon and sulfur is pretty small. So this side chain is still gonna be made up of nothing but nonpolar covalent bonds. And this one is methionine, three letter code MET, one letter code M. And this last one here that has a big bulky aromatic ring for a side chain is phenylalanine. Three letter code PHE, one letter code F. So remember when we have an aromatic ring as a substituent, it's known as a phenyl group. So you can remember phenylalanine as it's just alanine with an extra phenyl group attached. Okay, these next four are our polar neutral amino acids. So these are side chains that can't become charged at biologically relevant pHs. So our first one here has a two carbon amide as a side chain, and that's going to be asparagine. Three letter code ASN, one letter code N. 
Our next one here that has a CH2OH, so an alcohol or a hydroxy group as a side chain, that's going to be serine. Three letter code SER, one letter code S. Below that we have another one that has an amide group as a side chain. This time we have a three carbon amide. That's going to be glutamine. Three letter code GLN, one letter code Q. And this last one that has a secondary alcohol for a side chain, this one's going to be threonine. Three letter code THR, one letter code T. So our next group are the polar acidic amino acids. These are ones that have side chains that can act as an acid. So they can act as a proton donor. So when we put these in water, the side chain is going to donate a proton to a water molecule. So this first one that has a two carbon carboxylic acid, that is aspartic acid. And when it's donated its proton, when it's in the conjugate base form, we refer to it as aspartate. This next one looks really similar, it's just got one extra carbon. So we have a three carbon carboxylic acid side chain. This is glutamic acid. And just like aspartic acid, when glutamic acid donates its proton, when it's in the conjugate base form, it is referred to as glutamate. And for those of you who are only consuming the audio version of this lecture, aspartic acid's three letter code is ASP and the one letter code is D. Glutamic acid's three letter code is GLU and its one letter code is E. Okay, our next group are the polar basic amino acids. So these are amino acids that have side chains that can act as a base. So they're proton acceptors. So if we put these amino acids in water, the water is going to donate a proton to these side chains. And this first one here is a functional group that you probably have not seen yet. This is called a guanidino group. And this amino acid is arginine. Arginine's three letter code is ARG and it's one letter code is R. And this next one that has an amino group at the epsilon position, this is lysine. And lysine's three letter code is LYS and it's one letter code is K. Okay, these last six are not easy to classify. These are the amino acids that don't necessarily fit the standard classification based on polarity. So I'm going to show you the structure of these six amino acids and tell you how they're often classified in textbooks. Then I'm gonna tell you why that's a little bit controversial. So our first one here is glycine. The three letter code is GLY and the one letter code is G. So glycine is often listed as nonpolar. The problem with this is it doesn't have any real polar or nonpolar characteristics because it only has a proton as a side chain. So this is gonna make glycine highly flexible because it doesn't have the steric hindrance that other amino acid side chains have. So I want you to pause the video and see if you can tell me what else is different about glycine compared to all other amino acids. And what I have boxed in right now is a hint. So glycine is the only amino acid that does not have a chiral center. Okay, our next amino acid is one of my favorites and this is proline. So proline has the three letter code P-R-O and the one letter code P. So just like glycine, proline is often classified as nonpolar. So where does the controversy come here? If you look at the side chain for proline, it looks pretty nonpolar. You have nothing but carbons and hydrogens. So the problem is proline is the only amino acid that exists as a secondary amine. So you see the side chain has two attachment points. It attaches to the alpha carbon and it comes back around and bonds to the nitrogen. Now, as we saw earlier in the semester, when we have rings, we have a restricted structure. And this is going to make proline kind of the opposite of glycine. It's gonna make it very inflexible. So even though the side chain atoms of proline are nonpolar, it tends to behave like a polar amino acid would. So when you're looking at a globular protein, the prolines tend to be on the outer surface of the protein with the side chain exposed to the water. 
So even though proline appears to be nonpolar, it really does behave a lot more like a polar amino acid. Okay, so this next one is one you guys have probably heard of before. This is tryptophan. Tryptophan's three letter code is TRP and it's one letter code is W. So this is classified as nonpolar and it's because it has this big bulky aromatic side chain. So this functional group on the side chain of a tryptophan is known as an indol. And if you notice this indol has a nitrogen attached to a hydrogen. So even though the majority of this large tryptophan side chain is hydrophobic, you do have this NH, which can be a hydrogen bond acceptor or a hydrogen bond donor. So it can interact with water. And this next one is tyrosine. The three letter code is TYR and the one letter code is Y. And tyrosine is often classified as polar neutral. So the reason tyrosine is borderline is because it's got some very polar characteristics. This OH can interact with water and tyrosines are often solvent exposed. They're usually on the surface of proteins. However, individual tyrosine amino acids aren't very water soluble. In fact, they're less water soluble than alanine. And another thing I want to point out. So notice that the side chain on tyrosine is a phenol group. And remember, phenols can act as weak organic acids. So under the right circumstances, this tyrosine side chain can act as a proton donor and it can become charged. Okay, our next one is histidine. Three letter code HIS, one letter code H. So this one is traditionally classified as polar basic. So even though it has a side chain that can act as a base, since the side chain pKa is 6.0, most histidines are going to be uncharged at physiological pH. And our last one is going to be cysteine. So cysteine's three letter code is CYS, one letter code C. Cysteine is classified as polar neutral. So the controversy here is because the pKa is so close to physiological pH, we're gonna have a mix of two different species. Most of them are going to be in the SH form, but we're gonna have a measurable percentage in the S minus form. So remember, the electronegativity of sulfur is very close to that of carbon and hydrogen. So when it's protonated, cysteine is going to be nonpolar. However, when it's deprotonated, it's going to be charged and that's going to be very polar. So a lot of textbooks just kind of split the difference and classify cysteine as polar neutral.